Sir, CCTV uh, control. They they have visualized uh, the candidate, yeah. candidate sitting in the room. Yeah, and the examiner is also sitting, and so like that, you no, know, everything is seen by them. Yeah. Well, no, for the you know, Kerala, you know, city of health sciences, no. Uh, yeah. The exam hall is also under CCTV uh, coverage. If yeah. some hangi pangi occurs, they will immediately catch. In fact, uh, some five students of my institution. Uh, has problems now because uh, uh, they did uh, they, uh, they made some attempt to copy uh, okay i think it's getting We have 30 students uh, logged in. I think uh, today we have Dr. Joe from Aster, no? He's from Aster. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Welcome to today's clinics. Today is a pediatric show. Okay. Have you got any background in pediatrics? Um, no, sir. Actually, just MBBS. All of, all of us have background in pediatrics. Ah, yes, sir. MBBS background. MBBS. And, uh, all of us are children. Children also. <laughs> <laughs> or if you are not married and having kids, uh, at least somebody in the uh, related to you, know. There's a child in everyone's mind. Yes. So all of us are kids. That is why case presentation people like. I was listening to somebody's talk. They said uh, a didactic lecture is something which will not actually stimulate people. <laughs> For the case scenario, attention span will increase dramatically. That is because there is a story and people always like story. I think it is eight o'clock. Yeah. Okay. I just check whether the discussions are there. So Joe is there and uh, Dr. Aniket, you are there? Yes, sir. And from my out, uh, we have... Uh, is that um, let me just check Revigiran Revigiran are you there yes sir good evening sir okay good evening so uh, the uh, first, Joe will be discussing. Next, you will be discussing. And uh, if there are further questions, Aniket will be discussing. Okay. If there is any technical problem in between, Dr. Aniket will take over. Okay. That is the pattern. Yes. Okay. okay. We will start. Uh, uh, Professor Banuk, uh, Dr. Gida, are you all ready? Yeah. Yes, sir. One second. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this edition of ISGK PG Clinics. And this, in fact, is the last clinics of the, this month. And uh, we have been running an intensive schedule for the last couple of months. Uh, like you, we are also tired. In fact, we thought of uh, having only once a week session from next week onwards. Then Professor Jayanti informed me that you are going to have OSCE. And because of that, probably we'll continue to have a, a twice weekly clinics until the third week of August. And we will run only OSCE clinics uh, on Thursdays uh, in August. And uh, um, another thing is that the records of uh, uh, previous classes on June 15th are available on Facebook. So anyone who wants to check it, the copies of the videos are there, we can check it. We have we have plans to replay the, some of the videos which we have, which are complete in uh, the class from the beginning till end. If you have the audio and video with good quality, we may replay it and I, I will go through the, those videos this weekend and then we will take a decision and then you will be able to listen. Of course, I will be definitely showing you the instrument class and the pathology class, which I have already checked and it is in full video. Okay. With this introduction, I want to welcome today's faculty, Dr. Banu Vikraman Pillai and Dr. Gida Mamir. Dr. Banu Vikraman Pillai is the head of Pediatric Gastroenterology Division of Amrita Institute of Kochi, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. He, after his MD, 
took his uh, further training from us he is a diplomat of the american board of pediatric gastroenterology and pediatrics and he has worked in many hospitals abroad and then finally came to uh, about uh, 10 years 10 13 years ago and then ever since he is now working in amrutha institute of medical sciences as the head of the pediatric gastroenterology division he has an immense experience in pediatric gastroenterology and a very good academician and he is a regular uh, faculty who attends our class even though the subject may not be of any interest to him but still i have seen professor anu attending almost all the classes of the isc pg clinic showing that he is more interested perhaps than the residents to attend the clinics okay <laughs> once again welcome uh, professor ban thank you dr geeda is very senior not i would say not very senior middle level uh, senior consultant of pediatric gastroenterology at astor medicity she had her education from chennai uh, she had her md from madras medical college and dm from kilpack medical college at this moment i will just want to add one thing i was the person who actually uh, went and approved the seats for uh, dm at kilpack but uh, this was not liked by many of the persons in chennai in fact they called up and in fact uh, ridiculed me for having uh, approved uh, kilpack i said i am not looking at the beauty of the hospital i am only looking at the facilities okay and if there are more seats it's the, our students will benefit okay so i still remember those days when i came there to uh, sanction those seats it must be quite years ago okay now dr geeda is working as a senior consultant at aston med city and uh, she is a very good organizer i think all people in kerala and india would have seen her organizational capabilities during our last isg national conference at kochi not only that she is the leader of the women initiative in gastroenterology okay because uh, uh, and it's, it's an important it's an important area where we will have to concentrate and uh, in fact i was trying to count the number of uh, ladies in gastroenterology in kerala i must be uh, 15 or 16 i'm sure okay and uh, dr uh, geeda is doing a lot of work in that areas also both the faculty are interested in ibd as well as all other problems both the faculty are very experienced persons and uh, we are so glad to have both of them and uh, as a uh, uh, gastroenterologist who practice adult gastroenterology i would like to confess that my knowledge in pediatric gastroenterology is very minimal and to discuss such cases we require really experienced uh, persons in pediatric gastroenterology and we are lucky to have uh, both of them so over to you uh, professor banu and dr geeda thank you shall i share the screen sure jo you are ready now yes sir okay what's the pattern uh, do, do, uh, they will read it and uh, yeah they they okay. will read that i may interrupt them to ask questions and okay. then we'll go from there perfect perfect okay. so okay jo uh, uh, good evening sir please, yeah please feel free to you know ask any questions to me also if you have any because what oh, i wrote yes, may not be enough for you so if you need any extra you know information please feel free to ask that's perfectly all right so please go oh, ahead uh, 13 year old girl Uh, with frequent bowel movements for the past six weeks, uh, it is the free bowel movements are like four to five times per day. It's small amounts of stools, uh, takes a long time in the toilet, and has burning and pain at the anus when cleaning after the bowel movements. Okay. Uh, she also has abdominal pain for one week. and uh, it's diffuse pain and intermittent and she's also lost weight gains and she has some things of this type okay. so what else you want to know um sir uh, uh, this uh, actually uh, the 13 year old girl with six weeks history of so it's a 
subacute onset of symptoms sir. right and uh, four to five episodes it's a uh, small uh, quantity with increased frequency so most probably it could be a large bowel type of diarrhea okay uh, and uh, sir, whether the symptoms are more at night whether she has any symptoms at night nocturnal symptoms and uh, so this uh, sir she did not have any symptoms at night did not have okay did not have any symptoms uh, at night um and the stool sir was it mixed with blood or mucus no there is no visible blood in the stool so let me ask this way dr joe suppose okay. this child had abdominal pain for about 3 months and came with frequent stools for the last 6 weeks so what would you approach that kid for example say child is having abdominal pain for last 3 months so okay. and the child is having abdominal for three months how do you approach that patient uh, sir abdominal pain i would like to ask the severity of the pain and okay. uh, like where, where it is the associated symptom like uh, the associated uh, things like whether it is post prandially where the pain increases post prandially or okay. whether it's associated with any abdominal distension any ball rolling sensation in the abdomen during the abdominal pain or does she have any associated vomiting at that time and in history of fever, associated fever, uh, in history of any uh, um, as a fever mainly, and in other, other symptoms, like if she has any uh, cough with any sputum and any, uh, and also weight loss also. Okay. So remember, is a child, children with a chronic abdominal pain or recurrent abdominal pain, almost okay. 30, 40 to 50 percent of them has functional abdominal pain. Not everybody okay. has organic. So in the history, you have to, you, you have already mentioned many of the things which you should ask. You already mentioned many important things you have to ask to differentiate in your mind. Is it a functional pain or organic pain? Okay. okay. So what that is called, what we call red flag symptoms or signs. So that as include, as you suggested, fever, weight loss. Weight loss. Yeah. So appetite loss of appetite. Right, loss of appetite, all those things. Plus, very importantly, you have to ask about history of nocturnal awakening because of the pain. It is oh. not the pain that makes them difficult to go to sleep. That is different. The difference is you have to find out with a child who has gone to sleep, wake up in the oh. middle of the night because of the sleep. That is very significant in a child who has chronic abdominal pain. So a child has difficulty to go to sleep, not necessarily it is organic. Sometimes they may be thinking about something else. They may be thinking about the classes. They may be thinking about the teacher. They may be thinking about the friends. So that is not necessarily organic. But a pain that is making them as awake from the sleep, that is very significant. So in addition to the things which you mentioned, you have to ask specifically this, Plus, you have to also ask about joint symptoms, any arthritis, yes. any after ulcerations in the mouth, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, in, inadvertent weight loss. So not or you know, not you know, not planning for weight loss, they lost weight without wanting to lose weight. So those are very important things you have to ask. And also in the family history, in these patients, you had asked about, is there any family history of IBD or celiac disease or peptic ulcer disease? Consanguinity. Is, what is consanguinity? What is going to help you? Uh, sir, like that, a very early onset IBD, like maybe having consanguinity in the family. And uh, not necessarily, unless they also have IBD, so not necessarily consanguinity. Okay. okay, so consanguinity can be you worry about other things, but not necessarily from this perspective, but not necessarily. Okay. Okay. So you have to also find out where the pain is. Is it the more the pain away from the umbilicus, it is more likely it is organic. So periumbilical pain is more likely to be functional pain and does not make them lose weight, you know, unless they wanted to or does not have any other constitutional symptoms or fever or any other thing. So it is very important to ask these things in the history itself, because many times you may get a clue, is this functional? Because if the child may not want to go to school, that may be the reason for the pain, not necessarily an organic pathology, okay? Is it, are you, cl are you clear with that, Dr. Joe? Dr. Joe, you are muted. Dr. Joe, you are, mu no, are muted. muted. Could, could you hear me? Sir, hello. Could you hear me? Ah, okay, okay. Go, okay. continue. So, 
Tell me, uh, you know, go ahead, please. So hello, can you hear me, sir? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. To hear you. Are you talking? I, I can't hear him. Joe, can you unmute and mute and? He unmuted for a second, but he couldn't uh, hear me, I think. Joe is uh, technically uh, not muted now. <clears throat> can you hear me, Dr. Joe? Joe is not hearing. Okay. So please, uh, Dr. Uh, Revikiran, please go ahead. Go ahead with the rest of it until Dr. Joe comes back. Yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, there's uh, no history of any nausea, uh, no history of any nausea or vomiting. Uh, denies fecal soiling. And why is it? Is why is it important? The fecal soiling. Why is it important? Uh, uh, when there is uh, any uh, constant history of any, if there is constipation. This could be a spurious diarrhea. Uh, exactly. In children. One of the important reasons of what looked like diarrhea is constipation with the fecal soiling. And in this child, she's having frequency of stools without any visible blood. So you have to always think about whether the child is having constipation with fecal soiling. Says so you're absolutely correct. Okay, go ahead. Uh, appetite is uh, less. Uh, there's no dysphagia, no blood in stool. Yeah. No visible blood in the stool. Okay. So anything else you want to know in the present history? So you have a child, a 13 year old. Yeah, go ahead. A site of abdominal pain, sir. Diffuse abdominal pain. Diffuse. Okay. See in children, unlike adults, you may not get any specific area unless it's acute appendicitis or, uh, you know, gallbladder or the pancreatic because upper abdominal, you may not get a specific localized area, you may not get it. If you get it, well and good, but not necessarily. So many times children will tell you, they will point to the whole abdomen or point towards the belly button. So that's exactly what is going to happen in practice with these patients. Okay. Go ahead. Perianal itching, sir. No, but she had, bur she had burning and pain but, uh, during, you know, cleaning herself after the defecation. No skin, skin rashes or anything. No skin rashes history. No. What were you thinking about skin rashes? Uh, any uh, warm infestations which can cause uh, any larva or migraines? Uh, more likely than that, what other skin lesions you may be expecting uh, in a child with a five kilo weight loss with a loose tools and uh, abdominal pain? What are the skin conditions you may expect to of, see in IBD uh, patients? What skin lesions you may expect to see? Uh, not necessarily there all the time, but what skin lesions you may see in IBD patients, inflammatory bowel disease patients? Uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. More uh, commonly that. More commonly than that. Erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum. That is much more common than pyoderma gangrenosum. Yes. Okay. Which which uh, inflammatory bowel disease pyoderma gangrenosum more common? Crohn's uh, or Crohn's disease. No, it is ulcerative colitis. Actually. Almost all the extra intestinal manifestations are more sorry. common in Crohn's, except a couple of them. One is pyroma gangrenosum. Other one is what? Which is more common in ulcerative colitis? Primary sclerosing cholangitis. Yes, except for these Actually. two, most of the other extra intestinal manifestations are more common in Crohn's disease. It can, some of them, it may be even, but most of them are more common in Crohn's. I mean, I, uh, Crohn's, yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, past medical history, uh, nil significant. And uh, birth weight is 2.75 kilogram. She's yes. the first child of a non-consanguineous union. Uh, first sister, one sister. And, uh, uh, colon Met maternal, maternal grandfather, grandfather. sorry. Colon Maternal grandfather uh, had a colon cancer who died at uh, 70 years of age. Uh, mother is a housewife and father is an electrician. Developmentally, okay, she's eighth grade 
and immunization up to date and not attain menarche. Why is it not attain menarche important in this patient? Uh, uh, points towards uh, organic disease or you know, any chronic inflammatory conditions, usually they'll have a delayed menarche. Yeah. Right. So it is not uncommon yeah, for patients good. who come from endocrine because of delayed puberty or short stature, they may come to pediatric gastro for evaluation for possible IBD. So it is not uncommon for that to happen. Okay. That is why it is important. Okay, go ahead. So what are the possibilities to think about in this particular patient? So you know the story, right? Yes, sir. You saw the physical right. findings. You'll come, not physical finding, history wise, but you'll come to the physical examination in a minute. So, what are the possibilities you will think? Six weeks, uh, six, six weeks history of uh, uh, diarrhea with small quantity, and, uh, weight loss, and uh, no blood or mucus, and no fecal soiling. Uh, localizing it to the large bowel, sir. Okay. Could be uh, amoebiasis can be a possibility, sir. Infectious. Sure. Possible. And, uh, what is the full name of the parasite causing amoebiasis? Intermeba histolytica, sir. Where does it affect? Usually right colon, sir. Correct. In the cecum and the ascending colon, yes, correct. Colon. Okay. And what is the least number of uh, cysts that is required to infect a person? Four, uh, four uh, no, no idea, sir. What's the least number of cysts that could be necessary to infect a person? No idea, could be as low as one. One cyst. Can be as low as one. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Why is it, why is amoebiasis causing invasive problem like ulcerations and uh, all those things? Uh, you know, why, why does it do that? What property of the amoeba? parasite or the vegetative form or the trophocyte causing that issue. It produces, uh, Dr. Joe, can you answer that question? Uh, sorry, sir, I don't know, sir. Okay, what about Dr. Aniket? No, sir. So the vegetative form or the trophocytes causes, produces a hemolysin that causes the damage to the epithelium and the cells causing this ulcerative. That is why it, you know, it is caused the significant damage because it causes, produces a lot of hemolysins. That is the problem. Okay. Okay. So uh, amoebiasis definitely is a possibility. Infection, any other infection that can be a possibility? So amoebiasis agreed. That's a possibility. Cryptosporidium, what kind of diarrhea usually that causes? Agree, that is something to keep in mind. But what kind of uh, diarrhea does usually cryptosporidium causes? Usually is voluminous watery diarrhea, not just small amount of stools. Usually it is voluminous. These are all usual things, not necessarily always the thing. So remember that. So usually it is a voluminous watery diarrhea that causes cryptosporidium. Okay. So what's the full name for cryptosporidium? Full name no of the parvum. parasite? Parvum, correct. Okay. So any other infection that cause that can do this? Uh, Clostridium difficile, if any prior antibiotic use. Okay. This. Anything else? Uh, IBD usually has blood and mucus. Uh, not always. So not so always necessary. Like it can be there. If it's a colonic involvement, there may be blood. But not always the blood has to be must in IBD patients. Okay. It is, yeah, IBD in the sense ulcerative colitis patients, yes. Mm -hmm. Almost 100% of them will have blood in the stool. Whereas Crohn's disease patients, not necessarily. What is the most common triad of symptoms Crohn's disease patients manifest with in children? What are the triad of three common symptoms that come with most of the IBD patients, Crohn's disease patients? Abdominal pain. Abdominal pain. Abdominal, abdominal pain. Failure to thrive, growth failure, and uh, uh, diarrhea. Diarrhea. So growth, yeah, abdominal pain, diarrhea, either short, standing of growth or losing of weight. One of the two. Okay, it could be both. Yes, 
Okay, so that is exactly right. So majority, the more than eighty percent, they will have one of these symptoms. They will have it. Yes. Okay, so that is so it is important to have that you know in back of mind, but not necessarily always blood in the stool. Okay, sir. Okay, all right. So what other possibility? Any other infection can cause diarrhea like this with the weight you know with weight loss and the diarrhea and abdominal pain. GI diseases can cause, but yeah. it will be a small, small bowel type of diarrhea. Yeah. See, these are the small bowel, the small bowel diarrhea. Like, I know you guys very, you know, particular about these things. In practice, not necessarily always the case. Okay. So you cannot shut your mind. So it's only small amounts too. So it is not GI diseases. Please don't think about that way. So keep an open mind. Okay. GI diseases can do that. So what is, where does GI diseases? Uh, Ma you know, cause the problem. Which part of the gut? Uh, among the small intestine. Sir. Which part of the small intestine? Uh, proximal small intestine. Proximal small intestine. Duodenum or proximal jejunum. It is a proximal to in a small bowel that you know get problem. Okay. So what is the malabsorption that can associate with GIDSs? Uh, of. Uh, What uh, kind of number. what what malabsorption can exist along with the GIDSs? Uh, from iron deficiency anemia. No. What uh, kind of fat, uh, no, fat no, not fat malabsorption. Okay, Niket. Okay, Joe. The protein. No, it is lactose intolerance. So it is affecting the proximal small bowel. So what does it do? What does the GIDS do? What does the GIDS do? What is the full name for GIDS? GIDS lamblia. Okay. Lamblia. Or GIDS lamblia or is one more name for it? GIDS intestinalis. Both are both are same name for the same you know same you know, parasite. Okay. So it will you know cause. Damage to the villi, it can cause damage to the villi. It can cause subtotal villus atrophy sometimes. So that can cause a secondary lactose intolerance. Okay, which part of the villi does the lact lactase enzyme exist? Where is it present in the villi? You know we have the villi. You like villi are the finger-like projections. Which part of the villi? Does the lactase enzyme exist? Uh, tips. Right. The, the third, the the tip, uh, the, the tip uh, third, the, the yeah, the upper upper of the villi is down, you know. So it is. So the distal or the or the you know tip one third of the villi. Where does the sucrase isomaltase enzyme? Where does it exist? Uh, sorry, it's further down. Further down. Okay. So that is why. The lactase deficiency is the first thing that happens in acute diarrhea, because yes. the villi, when there is subtotal or a, you know, even a partial blunting, the tip is cut off, and the villi they, they causes lactase deficiency and causing lactose intolerance. Okay. Yes. Sir. All right. So, any other infection then can uh, cause this diarrhea? Uh, salmonella. So salmonella. Infection. Salmonella going on for six weeks. Yes. Less no. likely. Okay, going on for six weeks. Okay, Shigella salmonella campylobacter uses an acute gastroenteritis, not necessarily going on for five or six weeks. Okay, anything else? Can dientamoeba fragilis cause the problem? Have you heard that parasite, Dientamium fragilis? Yes, yes, sir. So can it do that? Yes, it can. It is not invasive diarrhea, but that also can cause chronic diarrhea in children. Okay? So, but it is not invasive. Yes, sir. Okay. So which is the parasitic infection that infestation that cannot get associated with or much more common in Dientamium fragilis patients, infected patients? Okay, Niket. Okay, Joe. Which parasite 
usually coexist with the endamoeba fragilis. Pinworms. Almost 20% of the patients, the diendamoeba fragilis patients, will have associated pinworm infestation or enrobiasis infection, infestation. Okay? So, now, I have... Uh, how do you check the stool for yes. parasites? Some basic silly, silly questions. <laughs> Uh, taking a wet mount of the uh, stool, yeah, I know, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about the you know, microbiology. So you are a clinician, you are sending the stool specimen to the lab. Okay, fine. How do you, what do you tell the parents or the patient? How many specimens do you want or need? And again? Three. Joe? Two specimens, sir. How many? Sir, the freshly uh, like fresh uh, fresh tool has tool. to be there. Agreed. Okay. How and many specimens? Three, three consecutive days. Three different specimens doesn't have to be three consecutive days. That is what tuberculosis you look for. So it has to be three different specimens, not from the same three. specimen. Okay. Okay. Three okay. different specimens, so three different times past tools. Okay. okay. Why do you okay. want three? Why do you want three? To better uh, increase the yield. Okay, the, suppose it, suppose there's only one specimen, what is the likelihood of yield causing a showing a parasite? I think that's I'm not sure, so less than 30%. No, it's about 60 to 70 percent, but oh, okay. more than 90 percent will be if it is three specimens. So that is important to make sure ideally you collect or ask them to collect three separate stool specimens and set test it, not one. Okay, sir. Okay, all right. Yes, so so infections, definitely a possibility. What is other possibilities? Inflammatory. We talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Anything else? Uh, yes, like in eosinophilic uh, gastroenteritis. gastroenteritis can cause a chronic uh, diarrhea, but it's unusual to cause perianal pain or things like that. It's unusual to do that. Eosinophilic gastroenteritis definitely can cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss. Absolutely, it can. Okay. All right. So, no examination. Go ahead. Examination: uh, the child uh, uh, child is alert uh, with weight of thirty four point eight kg, height of one fifty seven centimeters, uh, BMI is fourteen point one one. It's a uh, very uh, low BMI, sir. And mild pallor is there. Uh, no jaundice. Okay. So, what uh, is it? What is SMR? Means what? What other term? Other name is called Tanner staging. You have heard about the when it, name Tanner staging, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Second is all, ah, all pubertal patients when you examine, make sure that you examine the Tanner staging. Tanner yes. is uh, what is spell? How will you spell that? T A N N E R. Tanner. Yes. Okay. Tanner. Yeah. Sexual maturity rating. That's a you know that's S M R. Okay. So uh, go ahead. Uh, chest is clear, heart is clinically normal, abdomen is soft with a mild tenderness uh, noted in the epigastrium and also lower abdomen. Uh, two hepatosplenomegaly or masses, extremities are okay and uh, there is no focal uh, neurological deficits. Uh, perianal area examined in the presence of mother or any female attendant. Uh. I want to ask you, you have to tell me, you have to tell me the answer to this question. Honestly, how often do you note in the chart examined in the presence of and writing who was there in the room? How often do you document in the chart? Honestly, the answer to that question, answer. How often do you document that? I will answer it. <laughs> uh, even, even though, even though uh, I insist that a bystander or nurse is there, I never return it. Yeah, I wanted these people to know because it's extremely crucial. You please write it down who was there in the room when you examined. Because what you document that day is the only thing that is going to save you in the future from a malicious uh, lawsuit. 
so it's very important you document who was there in the room you you are signing the chat that day so you are not altering the chat later so it's very extremely important you must document examine in the presence of who it was there in the room it's very crucial it is not you know uh, do not believe it's only for a problem for the west it is a problem in our country too unless you are careful you will get bitten the question is only when so please be careful okay so examination showed the panel fissures and fleshy skin tags okay, okay tell me about a skin anal fissures what causes anal fissures in children what are the conditions that can cause anal fissures in children so please dr geeza please answer ask any questions if you may have please don't uh, uh, do not sure. hesitate please jump in any minute okay please sure. okay so Dr. Ravi, so what yes. what are the conditions that can cause anal fissures in children? Secondary to inflammatory bowel disease or a chronic strain. What is and what is the most what is the most common reason for anal fissure in a child? Inflammatory bowel disease is further much down. It can happen. Agreed. What's the most common reason? Dr. Proper, Aniket, proper bowel habits. Sir, constipation. constipation is the most important reason that's the most common reason okay so this is a child who has come with difficulty to defecate or difficulty means pain in the perianal area frequent stools small amount stools you must consider the possibility of constipation with difficult soiling in this particular child so in such a child fissures can happen because of the constipation is very very important to keep in mind okay what else can cause uh, uh, anal fissures dr jo other than constipation Sir, so, are you there? Ah, uh, yes, okay. I am here. Ah, what else can cause fissures in uh, chronic constipation in a child, other than uh, uh, you know constipation? Uh, Ravi. Anything else? Doctor Aniket. Infection. What infection? like uh, tuberculosis or hiv but uh, yeah it is less likely so, in the yeah, yeah just uh, don't uh, it is more likely in the adults, yeah so. so it is chronic constipation and straining number one diarrhea can do that too in children frequent passive stools also can cause fissures in children okay and also ibd especially crohn's disease patients they can get anal fissures and also sometimes it can happen in any other condition any of you kiri ravi aniket or jo in either anything else can cause fissures in children immune deficiencies okay. immune deficiencies especially which immune deficiency is the one that can cause fleshy skin tags and everything in child severe combined so, uh, severe combined no not severe combined it, it it can cause because of diarrhea and all but it is usually chronic granulomatous disease cgd that can cause fresh skin tags that may mimic crohn's disease actually in a child okay so and anything else you have to consider sir sexual abuse ah exactly sexual abuse so it's yeah. a child who said that sir emya very good so sexual abuse is a very important thing in keep in mind in a child with anal fissures so how do you differentiate the anal fissure from the constipation anal fissure or sexual abuse in you know, anal fissure is can you differentiate between the two by examining yeah emya can volunteer Sir, in IB, in a, um, there will be multiple anal fissures in sexual abuse. It will be in different directions. Right. So, in Crohn's, in constipation, where does it usually come? Six o'clock and twelve o'clock. Correct. So, it is anterior and posterior positions for constipation or straining. But suppose there are multiple anal fissures, irregular. You must. It can be Crohn's, but you must worry about the possibility of child sexual abuse. 
So please do not forget, it is not uncommon in our country anymore. So please keep in mind, they may land up with you and you may be the first person to examine. And if you did not detect it, the child is in jeopardy and also, and you may be in trouble because you did not report it. So it could be in double, double sword. It could be in trouble in both ways. Okay. So it's very important to think about the possibility in this kind of situation. Okay. So this is one weapon all pediatricians carry. This is called growth chart. So in a child, growth chart is extremely crucial. You, you have seen growth chart when you are doing MBBS, right? Okay. Growth chart is extremely crucial. There are different growth charts for three, zero to 36 months and two to 80, 18 years and also for boys and girls. So it's very important. And now you have a newer one called BMI chart. So this growth chart, height, weight, and BMI, these charts are extremely crucial in plotting a child to find out how the growth of the child is. Remember, one of the important things about a growth chart is you do not go by one reading unless it's too much off the chart, either further down or further up. If the, you have to see the trend, is the child who were at the 50th centile before, now it is the 25th centile, you must worry. Suppose you plot only at the 25th centile, you may not think there's a problem. That may be, you may think it is normal. But if you have known the previous height or the weight was at the 50th centile, now has dropped to the 25th or the 10th centile, that is extremely crucial, extremely important to and is pointing towards a very much organic problem. It could be malnutrition, it could be, or, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, it could be celiac disease, it could be any other conditions like that. So it's something to keep in mind. So it's very important to plot the height, weight, and the BMI. All of you know how to calculate the BMI, right? I don't need to tell you, right? Okay. How do you calculate, Look at BMI? Uh, uh, weight in kgs divided by height in meters squared, sir. Correct. So, how do you assess the nutritional status? In a child, this is important. You must know, and you're seeing, a, you know, uh, how do you, what all things do you check in uh, to assess the nutritional status? How do you assess? Uh, first of all, height, uh, weight, and then midam circumference. And, uh, 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 how do you check the weight uh, uh, of a child? Uh, 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 I'm going to ask some simple, silly uh, questions you have to answer. How do you check the weight of a child? Look at Depends on the weighing machine. <laughs> okay, depends on the weighing machine. So it's a five-year-old child. Five-year-old child, how do you check the weight of the child? So you can ask them to, if stand they can the stand, weight. you can stand on the weighing machine and uh, check the weight. But you have to make sure the child has got minimum clothing. Okay, I had a Crohn's disease patient. He was not gaining weight, not here when I was, you know, outside. This child, even in, uh, you know, in August, September, when it's hot, he will come with, a, you know, the, the, the undershirt, shirt, and a winter jacket on the top of it and check the weight standing on it to show me he has gained weight. Okay, so the children can really take you to task. Okay, so they should have minimum clothing when you check the weight. And you must check at least twice because they may move and half a kilo can go easily this way, that way. It is very important to check it twice at least. How do you check the height? Yes. Okay, Niket? The... How do you check the height? Suppose a 10-year-old child, child, you are examining a 10-year-old child, how do you check the height? Do we have anyone with a pediatric background amongst the uh, people who are attending? Mm -hmm. I know because of the lack of pediatric experience. I know. Find so, it Is there anyone? Uh, anyone? Look at, look at him. Look at him. Any, exam, any, any exam going pages? If you are there, please volunteer first. So stand against the wall and. Uh, right. It has to be. Flat, uh, correct. Agreed. The wall so it has to be flat. Uh, Right on the track. Go ahead. Uh, uh, and uh, keep a flat uh, uh, material on the head and uh, measure, mark it on the wall, then measure the wall. So. Right. So actually, the the what is the name of the material, name of the thing that you check the weight, height? 
what's the name of the equipment? You told about the scale for the height, weight. Yes. What do yes. you call the equipment that you check the height? Not able to recall, sir. It is called stadiometer. Stadiometer, S-T-A-D-I-O-M-E-T-E-R, stadiometer. So you keep it, you know, standing. You keep the child stand against it. If you don't have the stadiometer, yes, you can have a tape that is stuck onto the wall, not keep it moving, stuck onto the wall, and child stand against it. But when they stand, the heel of the feet, the buttocks, and the upper back, has to be touching the wall and the solid it has to be touching in one line and as you said earlier you keep a flat thing don't keep a newspaper because it will fold Bend. okay i've seen people putting paper on the top to check that don't it has to be flat you can put flat. a ruler or a flat thing something which don't crumble or you know fold and then check the weight i mean sorry height Okay, so you check the height, weight. You said about midarm circumference. How do you measure the midarm circumference? Doctor, any How do you check the midarm circumference? Uh, sir, we'll take the circumference in between the acromion process and the uh, polycranium process. Very, very good. Midway between the two. That's exactly right. And what should be the position of the hand arm? Uh, it should be. Uh, are you keeping up or keeping down or how, what is the position of the arm of the patient? It should be uh, by the side of the... Correct. It has to be hanging down, not folding because that, that is going to make the biceps contract. So it has to be hanging yeah. down and measure the, you know, this thing. How do you measure the mid arm muscle circumference? Uh, oh, what, sir, what, the... what, what kind of tape should you use, Dr. Joe? What type of tape should you use to check the, um, you know, midam, I'm sorry, midam circumference? What type of tape should you use? It shouldn't expand. Non-stretchable tape. Non I know non what you're going to say, you as the Hispanic. So you, you, I got the meaning. So non-stretchable tape. Okay. All right. So there are three, just like ABCs of the respiratory, you know, the, the cardiac arrest or whatever. There are three, you know, A, B, C. One is anthropometry, biochemical measures, and the clinical observation of the physical exam. Okay. So the anthropometry, you, you talk about the weight, height, all those things. So we talked about, you know, weight and height. So I'm not going to waste any more time with that. Midam circumference, you told about how do you measure the midam muscle circumference? Uh, okay, Joe. Midam circumference minus ah. the skin fold. Ah. Minus skin fold? Minus the skin fold thickness. So skin fold thickness is even three or four millimeter. All right. So minus two pi into skin fold thickness. Not two pi, just pi. Uh, pi, pi. Ah. Okay. All right. Just pi into the skin fold thickness and subtract that from the midam circumference. That will give the middle midam muscle circumference. All right. So height, we mentioned about this already. And there are certain assessment, nutrition assessment that you can do. You can measure the body composition assessment. I know we are not doing this often, but some of the things you do. One is bioelectric impedance analysis. Bioelectric impedance, it is actually not expensive to do that. You can get the percentage of fat and the protein you can get in the body. It is not you know, extremely sensitive, but it is a, some fluctuations can happen but it's reasonable to bioelectric impedance analysis. So that's a good test. What is dual energy X-ray absorptiometry? What's the other name for it? Okay, Joe, what? you're running away. Hello, sir. Ah, what is uh, dual energy X-ray absorb? What's the other name for it? You do it, man. You do it often. You do it in IBD patients. You do, you do it often for patients. What is other real, you know, for I mean, name that you use bone mineralization density scans dexa scan man dexa scan dexa scan, DEXA scan. Yeah, DEXA scan. Ah. so this is the full name is dual energy okay, x-ray okay. absorption that's a full name for it dexa scan is the short form that we use and the third one 
very rarely i have not used it air displacement it's only in labs but so keep in mind for example suppose they ask you can mention that also a uh, couple of lines you may have to learn because in case somebody ask what is it done or what is it you know suppose somebody asked but that is very rarely you know done so nutritional assessment so you are talking about anthropometry you're talking about biochemical how do you assess the you know what is the importance how do you uh, what is the importance of the biochemical testing you can diagnose the micronutrient deficiencies both the vitamins or the minerals or any of those things that you are want to check and you can confirm it if you have a clinical suspicion you can confirm it and you get a get a baseline that will help you to identify how the child is progressing for example vitamin d deficiency you can see how the child is improving or not so albumin which is a very common test that you do all of us do it every single day we do it tell me about the advantages of uh, testing albumin dr okay, joe Um, sir, um, I'm not sure. Okay, Nikit, what's the advantage of doing albumin? Uh, sir, in acute, it is also acute phase reactant, sir. So in case what's of what's the advantage uh, of doing albumin? I didn't ask disadvantage. Ravi. Long half life, so it has so. It is so easily done. Any lab can do. You can get a measurement within thirty minutes. You can get the measurement too. So you can't replace that kind of you know uh, easiness in doing a test. So albumin is a very easy test to do. But there are fallacies. So almost more than fifty percent of the albumin is extravascular. You are not measuring it. It is not intravascular. You are not measuring it. So that is a problem with that. It's in the skin. It's the muscle. Whatever. So it is not that sensitive because of that matter. Also, it can go down in malnutrition. It can go down in nephrotic syndrome patients. So not necessarily always there's a nutritional problem, but it's something. The other conditions also. It's other conditions also can make the albumin to go down. So there is a disadvantage from that perspective. But so easily done. So easily you can interpret. So it's a one very good test to do. One quick question, Doctor Ravi. What is half life of albumin? Fourteen days. Jo. Fourteen days. Any guess? Sir, Sir? Uh, two to three weeks. <laughs> you gotta. So twenty days. Albumin is twenty days half life. It's twenty days. So the immediately, so the child gets sick, it may not. Drop immediately. It may take a few days to start dropping. That's another disorder. The albumin. What is pre-albumin? What is pre-albumin, Doctor Aniket? You know albumin. What is pre-albumin? Yes, sir. Joe. Retinol binding. <laughs> What is pre-albumin? Uh, before the why is it called why is it called pre-albumin? Why is what is pre-albumin? See, when you do the protein electrophoresis, it is coming just before albumin. That's all. What is called pre-albumin? There is no other news to it. It comes just before the albumin. In the when you do the protein electrophoresis, that's called pre-albumin. What's the advantage of the pre-albumin? It is much more sensitive than albumin. Is much more sensitive than albumin. Okay, what's the half life of a pre-albumin? Ravi, Doctor Emiya, what's the half life of pre-albumin? Four days. I'm sorry. Two days. Two days. Just remember, twenty days for albumin. Pre-albumin is two days, so you will not forget. Two days is easy to remember. Okay, so because only two days, fluctuations can happen much earlier. So when child goes into malnutrition or kidney problem, the pre-albumin can drop. The problem with the pre-albumin is it is not easily measured. Not all the labs do it, and it's more expensive to do than the albumin. So it is not from that perspective, it is not that easy. But it is much more sensitive if you can do it, and the cost is not a problem. 
Retinol binding proteins similar to the prealbumin. It's also it is in a smaller body pool, so their rapid response to the protein energy depletion. Okay, so it is can be very similar to the prealbumin. The transferrin is also there. So, but at least remember albumin and prealbumin. Okay, so they are all negative acute phase reactants. That means when there is an you know acute inflammation, they all go down. Okay, what's a positive acute acute phase protein? Peritonitis. That, that you do every day. Peritonitis is one of them. What else? Much more CRP. commonly the CRP. 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 That's much more commonly you do, isn't it? Okay. All right. So other biochemical you can also assess somatic proteins in a patient. Somatic proteins in a patient. So that is you need some calculation. You need to calculate. So twenty-four a urine creatinine. And that is plotted against the height. There are standard reference charts are available. You can see and is expressed as a percentage. So 100% of the expected or 85% of the expected or 60% of the expected, whatever. So if the deficit is you know, less than 15%, it's called mild deficiency, mild depletion of the muscle mass. But the 15 to 30% inter, you know, difference is called moderate. More than 30% if it's low, low, it's called severe depletion of muscle mass. Children has to be in a positive nitrogen balance for them to grow. It's extremely important. Children has to be in a positive nitrogen balance to grow. So how do you assess the nitrogen balance? I know we haven't come to the IBD yet. Uh, Dr. Gita, I may take 10 more minutes of your time, okay? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So how, how do you measure the nitrogen balance in a child? See, most of the proteins are 16% nitrogen content. So you calculate, you may need the help of a dietitian to calculate the amount of the protein intake for the child for 24 hours. You divide that by 6.2, they make it 16%. That will give the amount of nitrogen the child has taken in. So nitrogen intake. So nitrogen intake minus to 24. So almost more than 85% of the nitrogen is lost from the body in the urine as urea. So you measure the urea nitrogen in the 24 urea, urea nitrogen in the urine and you subtract that from the intake. But also you have to subtract under 10 milligram per kilo per day. That is for giving a, 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 the commitment for a, you know, the protein that is lost in sweat, stool, skin shedding, all those things. So the 10 milligram per kilo, that's called factor. So that intake minus 24 urinary uh, protein, I mean, nitrogen output, my also subtract the 10 milligram per kilo per day. So this will give, so this has to be in a positive balance for the child to grow. Otherwise the child cannot grow. So it's very important to keep in mind. Okay. Are, are you okay? Are you all clear? Yes, okay. sir. So lipids, Essential fatty acids are extremely important to measure to because these deficiencies can cause significant skin problems and uh, you know uh, issues. So essential fatty acid deficiency must be looked into. And all of you know about measuring the vitamins and minerals. So I am not going to go into that right now because you know it. The lymphocyte count is another important one in pediatrics. So keep in mind. In malnutrition, if it's a mild malnutrition, the lymphos, absolute lymphocyte count is less than 1,500. With moderate malnutrition, if it's a 800 to 1,200, is less than 800, it is considered to be severe malnutrition. So that is something to, that is affecting the immunity of the child. So it's a very practical importance for the child uh, to, in, the, in, the, in the outcome of the disease. Physical examination, you know, you look for pallor, you look for a vitamin deficiencies, dry scaly skins look for essential fatty acid deficiency or biotin deficiency. That niacin deficiency can cause dermatitis. What other thing can cause niacin deficiency? Dr. Kiran? Zivi? Uh, niacin deficiency uh, cause what? Diarrhea. Diarrhea. What dementia. is the other one? Dementia. dementia. So three mm -hmm. Ds. Okay. Diarrhea, okay. dementia, dermatitis. Three Ds. Okay. All right. So they can also cause an thyroid, look for iron deficiency, iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency. So you have to look for a complete head to toe examination of the child 
look for any iron vitamin deficiencies or mineral deficiencies in these patients. Okay. So growth chart plus the history of the growth chart. You can look at the previous growth chart also. Medical history, food diary, and then you decide the plan. What is the recommended nutrition strategy for the child? Now coming to this child, the labs. Uh, you know you can go through it fast because uh, Prakita is a very interesting patient. Hemoglobin uh, is nine point four total anemia. Is so just give me the interpretation. You don't have to read. Just tell me the interpretation uh, of the CBC. Uh, there, is, uh, there is anemia with uh, leukocytosis, which is predominantly neutrophilic. Uh, with uh, increased platelet or thrombocytosis and MC, uh, microcytic uh, picture. Okay. So what are the causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia? Uh, hypoproliferative anemia. Sorry, fluid. Hypochromic, uh, hy I, microcytic I, hypochromic anemia. What are the conditions that can cause hypo microcytic I, hypochromic anemia? Iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency, so. number one. That's the number one thing to say. Perfect. Okay. Thalassemia, sideroblastic anemia. Thalassemia, it is a thalassemia trait. Trait, yes, sir. Okay, not full thalassemia. Thalassemia trait. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Sideroblastic anemia also. What is sideroblastic anemia? Have you seen one? Extremely rare. Okay. What is still sideroblastic anemia? Because you said it, what is sideroblastic anemia? Of uh, sitting in the RBCs. So, Dr. Joe, uh, what is the troublous? Spectrum of uh, myelitis. Okay, sure. what is the troublous anemia? What happens in that? There is iron, okay, but the hemoglobin cannot incorporate into it. So, it is okay. it's a starvation in plenty, basically, in cerebrosic anemia. Okay, there is a lot of iron is there. So that is what is staining as a sideren. There is iron, but it cannot incorporate into the hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. All right. So what is, suppose this a child has got microcytic hypochromic, microcytic hypochromic anemia, severe intermittent abdominal pain. And you examine this child has got a, uh, you know, blue line on the, on the gums. Uh, lead poisoning. Lead poisoning, poison. correct. Lead poisoning. Okay. So it, just to complete, go, go over with it, pyridoxine deficiency can cause hypochromic microcytic anemia. Okay. And copper deficiency also can cause hypochromic microcytic anemia. All right. So CRP is elevated. Okay. Go ahead. Tell me the rest of it. Uh, total protein of 3.1. Albumin is low. So hypoalbumin is 3.1. Yeah. Uh. Uh, vitamin D is again deficiencies. So okay. Okay. PCG and HV negatives. Okay. So the, we did the scope because the child has come with this. So the upper endoscopy shows the normal villus pattern is not seen. I know it's not a microscopy, yeah. but typically you see that. You can yeah. see the villa even on it. The typical scope you can see it, but you don't see it. And the colonoscope showed, uh, you know, ulcerations, patchy ulcerations with x ray in between half day and intermittent normal licking mucosa. Okay? So they gain same similar thing as this, intermittent normal looking mucosa, ulcers with x-ray sitting on it. And the, you know, so basically this is a description of it showing after in certain areas, deep ulcers with intermittent normal looking areas. So let us, histology biopsy was sent to histology, histopathology. What else will you send the histopathology for? The can you get what else you will send? You have sent the patho, patho, you know, biopsy specimen for histopathology. Anything else you want to send it for? Mm. Any other test? Anything, any, test? Any other test that you want to send PBPCR. it for? PBPCR. Ah, you can do this PBPCR or you can, there are many labs who do something called mycobacterium tuberculosis panel. You can check all okay. three of them, which get the direct smear, gene expert, and also the culture. Everything can be done from the two or the two, three or four specimens biopsy that you do. One bottle you send it, they can do all three. Okay, it was sent for that. And that of course, subsequently came back negative. And the biopsy showed active Crohn's. I'm not going into that because we have a lot of other things to cover. Okay, because histology, you all know, 
it showed active Crohn's disease, chronic granulomatous colitis and ulcerations, it showed. This is one article, please try to uh, find out and read. We won't have time to go through it in the sense that this uh, gastroenterology just came out really recently. It is showing it's a systematic review and a consensus statement for about more than 200 pediatric gastroenterologists. Consensus statement showing what are the predicting factors that outcome, what, how can you predict outcome with certain things? So what's the, how can you predict the surgery? How can you predict the chance of, you know, getting into growth failure? What's the chance of, you know, so it's some, there are 27 recommendations or, you know, statements in that. So uh, please go through it and uh, keep it handy because uh, it's something which may be handy. I will give a couple of summaries I will give you. This is from that particular article. So surgery, risk of surgery is more if the child has been diagnosed as adolescent, when there's already existing growth impairment, the child has got not two or CAD15 polymorphisms and aggressive disease behavior, ASCA positive. Okay, these are our risk factors for earlier sur surgery for this pa patient in a child. Isolated colonic disease, less risk chance of a surgery. Okay, so then again, what's the chance of penetrating or stenotic disease? Older age, so older, you know, patients, small bowel disease, more risk to have penetrating or, you know, fistulizing stenotic disease, not, and also ASCA positive or the other serology positive, ASCA or OMPC or antiflagellin or CBER positive, they are more likely to get into these complications. Also same for NOT2 and CAD15 polymorphism. Patients with perianal disease are more likely to get penetrating or stenotic disease. So please go through that article because we won't have time to go through all of them. You know, male sex patients, young age onset, small bowel disease, aggressive disease, diagnostic delay, they are all risk factors for growth impairment. In child growth is one of the most important things to look at. So this is something to keep in mind. Okay, this is all in that particular article. So. Uh, you know, so what are all things you want to do before starting treatment for this particular patient? You are, it's a 13 year old girl. What are things you want to start, do before starting treatment? You have done, made a diagnosis. You found there is Crohn's disease. You found there is, uh, you know, in the histologically, there is involvement in the stomach, large intestine that was in that thing. So what are all things you want to do before starting treatment? She would come into the category of high risk disease because of the presence of perianal disease as well. Okay, so what are, what are things you want to do before starting treatment? Uh, evaluate for small bubble involvement. Very good. You have to assess the whole extent of the disease. That is very important. What else? Anything else? Uh, exclude tuberculosis also. Okay, we have sent up you know the triple strategy for this thing and also other things you have to do. What are the what other tests you can do? Uh, interferon gamma release as well. Like okay. Gamma. And, uh, chest x ray or a CT chest. Okay. Anything else you want to do? Rule out any active uh, infections, abscesses. Okay. So you may think about starting thiopurines. Possibly, yes, you may yes. not. But if you're planning to start, make sure you send TPMD as a. You can give because. Once your document is normal and the child is going to leukopenia with even a prop, appropriate doses, you may not be getting to task. But if you did not check and child went into leukopenia and you know problems with the leukopenia problems or anything, you may be getting to task. Why didn't doctor, why didn't you do it? So please do. I know it costs money, about six thousand rupees it costs, but please make sure you do. Okay. And always, always do, because you are going to start long-term and, and yeah, yeah, immunosuppressive therapy for these patients. Please check the anti HPS antibody. You have done, you all do pre op serology, but make sure you do anti HPS antibody titer. Make sure they're protective uh, titer for these patients. This patient had a borderline 9.8. So I gave a booster, a month later recheck, it was 253, has definitely protective immunity. This is very important. Very important. Mandra was done. It was eight millimeters. Said not more than ten, but it's around eight. And always, all these patients with immunosuppressive therapy, make sure you give influenza vaccine every year. Influenza vaccine every year. It's very important to do. Do not forget. What kind of influenza vaccine will you give? Injection or the nasal spray? 
Yeah, the nasal influenza vaccine also available. Nasal flu vaccine is available. What will you use? Why? Why? In injection is killed vaccine. Nasal vaccine is flu vaccine is a live vaccine. So it can cause actually infection. It's immunosuppressed patients do not use the live vaccines. It must be killed vaccine. So don't use the nasal flu vaccine. It has to be injectable vaccine. And every year, every year. Okay. So vitamin D, because we already checked earlier and it was negative. I mean, it was deficient. So you started treatment. And also, I know many of you are probably are not doing always do baseline eye examination. You, after you make a diagnosis, make sure you get a baseline eye exam, make sure there is no UVA, just make sure there is no eye problems. And after that, every year, the CCFA or the, or the all these associations will tell you to monitor the eye or ophthalmo annual eye examination. It's important to do it. Okay? Ophthalmo examination done, it was normal. This child, because she had braces, we, could, we didn't do MRI, otherwise I would have preferred an MRI endrography. CT endrography was done, that showed distal ileum and large bubble disease. So even though distal ileum was, you know, in the terminal ileum showed a few after, the biopsy didn't show anything. In the CT endrography, there was involvement in the small bowel. So there is involvement in the stomach, the small bowel, as well as colon in this particular patient. But there was no obstruction. Absolutely. CT test was also at the same time with the CT and was unremarkable. So what do you want to treat with? Induction of emission, I would like to start her on steroids. So. Okay. What is the preferred agent that you will use, use you should use? In is a teenager is coming to you, active Crohn's involving the small intestine, stomach, and the colon. Which drug is probably better? Or which is the better rec recommendation wise? What is the recommended thing you are supposed to use. At least you give the option to the parents to decide that. You should use biologics. Yeah, you should use biologics. But the parents may not be able to afford it. That's okay. You document it. You must document it. So give the option. The parents couldn't afford it. You because And so you used it. So it's important to do it. Okay? So suggested it. But the father is just an electrician, mother also, they don't have too much money to you know, cover for her. So because of that, they gave prednisone or prednisolone. So how do you treat, uh, how do you give prednisone, uh, Dr. Ravi? Uh, actually, 1 mg per kg uh, to a dose of 40 mg per, 40 mg per day uh, uh, to be given for uh, uh, four, uh, four weeks and then uh, taper uh, 5 mg per week uh, up to maximum three months. Where does it say four weeks to give 40 milligram per kilo per day for four weeks? Does it say somewhere? Does it say to give for four weeks the full dose? You won't find it anywhere. Most of the time you need over two weeks. Sometimes there may be a few more days you may extend depending on how the child is doing. Otherwise you need it for two weeks. Then start tapering five milligrams every week you give it okay and ideally given md mr after breakfast in the morning as a single dose why single dose after breakfast it's a long half life sir. loud loud please uh, i didn't hear a long half life sir. Uh -uh, that is not the reason joe and again, why do you give? Sir, you cause long. gastritis, sir. We do it in adults also. Steroids are generally given in the morning. In the Bye. morning. Ah. When do you really check for serum cortisol? Sir, you don't enter the normal circadian rhythm. Ah, that's true. <laughs> so to, to, limit, to limit the suppression of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, to limit this, you may still get suppressed. But at least you are trying. So limit the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis suppression will be kept to the minimum if you give a single dose in the morning. 
Okay, so it's very important. To, you know, so you have to know because these things your examiners can definitely ask. Uh, it is, that is not just a period. I guess Vargas sir was telling you do it in adults too. So you have to know the reason why you do it. Okay, and these children along with the vitamin D, multiple supplementations were also given, and I also gave Ensure. You all know Ensure, right? You have seen Ensure, right? Yes, all of yes. you. Ensure yes. is a formula. It's a polymeric formula. Pediasure, Ensure. These are formula that's available in the market. So it has got a good balance of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So it's a very good supplement that you can give for these patients. So I gave that also. Will you use azathioprine? Yes. If so, when will you start? Starting as soon as because it takes at least twelve weeks for the. Very good. To come very good. That's exactly right. That's very good. So you always check the TPMD if at all possible, and we start it. And the TPMD results are available. You can start with a full dose. If that is not back yet, you may have to start at a lower dose and then recheck it and increase it. Okay. What are the precautions you will suggest in a patient who is going to start on a cetaphil? And again. What are the precautions you will tell the parent, tell the parents or the patient, depending on the age of the patient? What precautions will you suggest? Any severe abdominal pain? For very good. Very, very good. What else? And monitoring LFT liver function test to more important than LFT. CBC complete. Ah, more important. Than LFT is important. I agree. First week. First ah. week every CBC. week. Every week uh, for the first one month, and then uh, what else? So, so you need to get periodic blood. You need to get periodic blood test done. You need to get, uh, you know, uh, you know, check, report if there's severe abdominal pain. What does the abdominal pain indicate, Dr. Joe? Severe Fine. abdominal pain. Severe epigastric pain due to the. Due to what? Pancreatitis. 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 Suppose the child had pancreatitis and the child recovered. Will you restart the pan as a therapy again? You. Can so it may not always no recover. never 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 because it's an idiosyncratic reaction. It is not a dose dependent. Okay. You cannot give azathioprine or six mb for that matter for a child who developed pancreatitis from azathioprine. You cannot give it. Okay. One more okay. suppression you could decrease the dose and give it, but pancreatitis it's an idiosyncratic reaction. You cannot give it. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, Any other precaution you will suggest? Very important in our, our, you know, especially in our part. Sunsc sunscreen. Photosens. Yes, sir. Sunscreen. Very important. They can make the child prone to develop skin cancer. So okay. you have to document. You tell them and you document that you told them. Okay. Okay. And folic acid supplementation is also necessary. Okay, so you as you suggested earlier, you started. We started both together. And what advice will you start regarding the diet for this patient? I told you I started her on, uh, uh, you know, the ensure, the, the, uh, ensure feeds. Uh, but what other advice will you tell? The parents will ask you, what are the dietary advice I'll, I I'll, I to, I have to follow? What are, what I have to follow? So low residue. Have, uh, okay. on fiber. have you have you heard exclusive enteral nutrition? Uh, P and okay. Nutrition. What is it? What uh, is exclusive? Like the, like the formula feed that we can okay. give that, yeah. that gives all the nutrient all the macro and micronutrients as required, but in a very uh, easily uh, palatable. But, okay. but problems uh, it ah. might not uh, palatability might be a problem. But palatability is not the problem. Acceptance is the problem. It, they, okay. The ensure is all very palatable. A very sweet, very palatable drink. But the acceptance mm -hmm. is the problem. The other children, other you know, patients, the, the people at home will be eating food and the okay. child cannot eat food. So you cannot give any other food the exclusive okay. formula and feeds and to give for how long to see the benefit? Uh, at least 8 to 12 weeks. So. Right. So you will see improvement within four weeks, you will see, but you are supposed to give for at least eight to, eight to 12 weeks to see the real good benefit. 
Okay. And if those patients, if you start that, you don't need to start steroids because exclusive enteral nutrition is probably a little more better uh, advantages than the steroids to bring to remission. And, and, and so you can start the azathioprine at the same time. By the time azathioprine come on board, you can, you know, decrease the exclusive enteral nutrition. Have you heard the name specific carbohydrate diet? Specific carbohydrate diet. Have you heard that term before? Also, have you heard the word Crohn's disease exclusion diet? Please read these two also because this uh, I'll give you some you know tips on it. But please read this also because it's not just exclusive nutrition that is beneficial. That is very beneficial. No question about it. There is something called specific carbohydrate diet, and also there is something called Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Okay, so the specific carbohydrate diet, you eliminate all grains from the diet. There's no rice, no wheat, nothing. There is all grains are eliminated. No, all sugars are eliminated except honey. And all milk products are eliminated except hard cheese and fermented yogurt. Uh, this thing, only those two and all processed food, but they can eat other things like fish or, uh, you know, uh, vegetables, uh, you know, chicken, all those they can eat, no problem. But they cannot eat, uh, you know, all grains, sugars, except honey, honey you, cannot, you can consume, and also all milk products except yogurt and hard cheese. They could just no, but hard cheese, they, and all processed food. This is called specific carbohydrate diet. And if you do this, this also can bring to remission for these patients almost as good as the N L exclusive enteral nutrition. Yes. Okay. And so the you know exclusive enteral nutrition I already, you already mentioned. So it decreases it's an anti-inflammatory, decreases inflammation, improve weight gain, improve growth, improve bone health, and at the same time because there is no immune suppression, you can catch up on the vaccines if the child has not received vaccines before. So this is very good to to treat, but child cannot drink or eat anything else. Now, the Crohn's exclusion diet, exclu exclusion diet is it's a mix in the sense that 50% of the calorie requirements is given as partial enteral nutrition, like the ensure or pediatric, depending on what you said. Other 50%, you give the Crohn's is the elimination, diet, which is mo much more easy to follow. You exclude animal fat and fried foods, wheat, red meat, and milk. That's it. You eliminate animal fat, wheat, red meat, milk, and fried foods and processed food. These are things that is excluded. But you can have all the, for a Malayali, this is good. So you can eat all rice. So rice, egg, potato, chicken, fish, fruits. So all these things they can eat. So if you give 50% of the calorie requirement as uh, this combination, plus 50% as a exclusive a partial nutrition, that also can bring to remission almost as good as the exclusive nutrition, exclusive enteral nutrition. So it is a good mix that is, you know, uh, that can be followed. Okay. So this is the reason I gave this patient little more than 50% ensure feedings. I told to limit, I, even for all patients, I do limit red meat, fried foods and bakery items. And also popcorn and malaria. I told them to not to eat. So after one week, she started having fever with the chills. No other symptoms, just fever with chills. So she's still on zero, still on the azathioprine. So she started with a fever, coming with chills and fever. So what do you think she may have? It's a female child. What do you think is more likely to think? Urinary Exactly. So we checked for urine. It was negative. There is no urine. There's no evidence of urinary infection, urine routine. And we sent for culture, which came back negative later. And the white count is high, 80% neutrophils. So CRP is, you know, it is around hovering around 822, but of course she was on steroids for the past one week. So rest everything is negative because we thought it could be viral fever. We held the azathioprine for three days. Continued the steroids, we can't just stop the steroids like that. And the fever came down. And so we restarted the azathioprine. Again, she started getting fever, high fever, 102 fever. She gets a fever around 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And she came back to the OP, her CRP shot up to 130. White count also went up to 19. 
and urine showed numerous pus cells, but so suspected maybe UTI. So we started on cefixim for five days, waiting for the stool urine culture to come back. Urine culture again came back negative. And you held the azathioprine because again, because of the high grade fever. Repeated chest x-ray also because high fever I, I did because his double immune suppression sent the uh, blood culture, got an ultrasound to make sure there's an intraabdominal absence. They were all unremarkable. Held the azathioprine. So what should we do now? So culture came back two days, three days, later, urine culture came back negative. Chest x-ray and all same day that is back is negative. What should we do now? So we started azathioprine again, but what happens is when we restarted the azathioprine again, she shoots up to fever. Fever chills at 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. So what we did about three or four times, give it fever. So we made a diagnosis of drug-induced fever. Mm -hmm. So azathioprine is notorious to cause drug-induced fever. This is an actual patient. So we can be worried because it's a double immune suppress. There's an abscess or what it is going on. And the mind was borderline. So whether it is the tuberculosis coming up. So we are worried. So drug-induced fever stopped the azathioprine. Absolutely no fever after that. So what will you do now? We start her on. So within two days, the fever came down. CRP came from 135 to 11. So it, she perfectly fine. So we start her on methotrexate. Okay. When you start methotrexate, what are the precautions you tell the parents? Very important. You have to tell me. You are going to start methotrexate for a child. What will you tell them? Folic acid supplementation, sir. Folic acid supplement you need? I gave it. Okay. What other advice will you tell them? Yes. You have to monitor LFT, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Isn't it true? Yes. But what is yes. what is my, what is equally important? She's a ch girl. You are giving methotrexate. Yes. Is it teratogenic? 13 years. She's 13, but she'll become 14 next year mm -hmm. and 15 the following year. And she, mother is not staying with her all the time. She may get pregnant. Okay. So you have to make sure you tell them in black and white, tell the parents the child cannot get pregnant while the child is on methotrexate. There is no easy way of telling. You bluntly tell them there is no choice. And you document it told them. You must document that you told them. Not only telling them is telling is important, but you document you told them. Telling is not enough. Okay, this is very important. So these are very very crucial points you have to remember. Okay, and I one one second. What is the difference between azathioprine and methotrexate in the management of IBD? Okay. No, methotrexate start immediately. Within a few days, it will start working. Azathioprine takes about 12, 10, 8 to 10, 12 weeks, isn't it? So, methotrexate is much faster acting. So, this child, steroids are, of course, tapered off in 12, 8, 10 weeks. Steroids are off. She was doing well on methotrexate folic acid, started getting loose tools. CDV suspected that was negative, but again, bottom line, she got a relapse. She has, uh, you know, repeated, she has active large ulcerations in the colon and gastritis. And so this time we told we don't have a choice, but we have to start on uh, right. as the, the uh, biologics. And we started on Adalimibab. She did beautifully well. And gain, weight gain happened. No more problem. She attained menarche last two months, three months ago. She got COVID in May. And then she has a mild infection. So I held one injection of the as a map and held two doses of the methotrexate until she became negative, then continued it. She's doing well. Do you have any questions? I'm sorry I took a long time, a uh, lot of time encroached into Dr. Gita's patient. I'm so sorry, Dr. Gita. Not at all. I think we'll have mine another day. Margi, <laughs> sir, please tell what we should do. I'm very sorry. I overshot the time all, because, all, because no, I no, think no, no. It, are, was a, it, it was a treasure of information. I enjoyed every bit of it. <laughs> okay. Every, I, we enjoyed every bit. I was uh, repenting for not having invited you earlier. 
that's okay <laughs> yes, no. this would have benefited no we actually the fag end of their uh, course i feel that i should have invited you you are full of knowledge you are a treasure of knowledge thank uh, you thank I you should have, i should have utilized your services uh, gida how much time you want it doesn't no, it's okay sir uh, pardon it's not i think the students also will be fatigued it's not a question of time we want i can finish it off in 10 15 minutes but uh, i was thinking that uh, it's okay not an issue we can okay, have another I time i think also. we will continue uh, maybe another 15 minutes we'll uh, rush through it as a very ultra short let, let me stop sharing sorry okay. so we are continuing yeah please i am sort of lost okay. Uh, do you have any problems, uh, Doctor Gida, to continue? Uh, no, it's okay. I think because we may not get a chance soon. No, that's At also least... fine with me. Not an issue. Even okay, if we that... cancel it, it's okay. okay. I'm not. No, no, don't. Please don't cancel. Please. At least uh, uh, they will have an idea about uh, at least the causes of petrosplenia megaly. No, we are. I thought we'd be just discussing one particular aspect. That's why. So, who's presenting? Who will be talking? Uh, On same three pages. Same three only. Okay. So, I need a volunteer. Can mm -hmm. somebody? Joe, can you restart? Ah, uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah. So, so just go through this uh, case. We'll just finish in say fifteen twenty minutes. I won't take much time. Uh, Ten year old boy. Apparently, well, child prior to one month developed high grade fever over two to three days duration. Treated with paracetamol, but fever persisted. Associated with upper abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. From second day, noticed yellowish discoloration of eyes and dark urine. Five days after the onset of illness, noticed swelling of leg, uh, swelling of feet, and mild abdominal distension. No history of bleeding tendencies. No history of any altered sensory. Or no history of any chronic drug intake. Uh, the past history, uh, the past history of jaundice six months ago, which is also associated with high blood urine and throat row, treated with homeopathic medications for two weeks and recovered. No swelling of feet at that time. No previous transmissions or surgeries. So why don't you just interpret it quickly? We won't uh, spend much time. Uh, I'm just tell what goes in your mind. Uh, yeah. A problem with pain with uh, nausea and vomiting with high grade fever and jaundice. Uh, we should definitely think of hepatitis. Uh, because per the patient has a history okay. of uh, hepatitis six months prior. Um, so. Okay. What hepatitis are you thinking of? Is it hepatitis? Uh, with prodromal you saying um, hepatitis can you qualify yes, viral viral hepatitis no? okay so we're talking about viral hepatitis with this history you're saying uh, prodrome what else uh, a prodromal pain nausea and vomiting and uh, yeah and that uh, there is some worsening of uh, in ca is also developed abdominal distension so i would uh, suspect okay. this uh, like phases of liver like maybe Uh, he is going into uh, having ascites, developing ascites. Okay. So that's not a simple viral hepatitis. If there was no history of swelling of feet and distension like this previous past history, high colored urine, prodrome, no swelling of feet at that time, maybe that was a some some ordinary viral hepatitis. Yes, sir. But Because if the symptom the... includes distension of yeah, abdomen and swelling of feet, the... you will think of. Uh, worsening like ascites and uh, acute liver failure. Man. So what is that called? Is it acute liver failure? Fulminant hepatic failure. Is it fulminant hepatic failure? Do you get this kind of presentation? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, actually, you patient. Said in fulminant hepatic failure, failure, the definition is for what? Uh, what is the definition of fulminant hepatic failure? Uh, Ma'am, no, no. Uh, has has uh, uh, develops jaundice and within 
uh, patient also complicates with either and uh, initially with jaundice and febrility and further uh, develops uh, ascites or hepatic enteropathy within 7 days yeah okay in a previously uh, normal normal chart yeah so you don't uh, think that the patient has got a previous liver disease that's when you they call it acute liver failure right okay so when there is a past history of when there's a past history of jaundice which was documented or treated and this patient is now uh, presented with again jaundice with swelling of feet what what is what would be the possibility so it's an acute acl of acute from chronic yeah, this could be an acute or a chronic liver failure right liver failure acl of any other history that you want yeah so in the uh, any other uh, condition that you may think of uh, because she has differential history, diagnosis uh, not like homeo homeo medications have been taken for that 6 month prior so i am mean, yeah. as a cause it could be some um the drug induced can also cause hepatitis ma'am and also a young with a uh, boy with recurrent uh, jaundice and worsening other so uh, like uh, metabolic disorders like wilson's um okay then um uh, good so you can think of uh, viral hepatitis if there was no swelling of feet you could have thought of this can you think of chronic hepatitis b among the viral uh, hepatitis can it this be a patient with viral hepatitis had a previous history of jaundice and now developing liver failure due to any drug induced or alternative therapy is that possible uh, yes ma'am it's possible but thing is possible so you have to keep your possibilities open we have only heard the history we have not gone to the examination so this is a okay. history of a young boy 10 year old boy who is presenting with a prodrome fever something similar to a viral hepatitis except that now he's got swelling of feet and mild abdominal distension yeah worsening or probably going in for some decompensation with a previous history of jaundice uh, so if the previous history of jaundice is there then you can think of a, a chronic hepatitis when viral hepatitis b is possible you can think of recurrent jaundice due to something like wilson's disease anything else anybody else dr kiran but, and dr aniket yeah. who's that devi yes, kiran you can think of but there is a differential diagnosis no but oh, the adult comes yeah. like that recurrent jaundice hepatitis it does pardon autoimmune hepatitis yes autoimmune hepatitis also we won't go into the further metabolic conditions that can happen there are a couple of others but usually the pattern of jaundice or the pattern of presentation in the in this age group is similar to that of adults you don't have to think of exotic metabolic conditions or inborn errors of metabolism beyond the age of 5 to 8 years 8 years of age usually all these metabolic problems and the inborn errors of metabolism in children will present before 5 years of age so after 5 years of age children who present like this the differential diagnosis will be similar to that of adults it will be hepatitis uh, normal hepatitis and including hepatitis b you have to think of two you have to think of uh, metabolic conditions like wilson's disease autoimmune hepatitis but carry syndrome uh, will you think of any uh, infiltrative conditions like uh, malignant conditions um, if this previous form. history was not there or the sister was uh, very uh, recent like one month or two months ago you can also think of infiltrative because leukemia can also present like this in children okay, okay. so possibilities you have mentioned on clinical examination carry on uh, well nourished uh, he has pallor he is anemic but no signs of club or clubbing puffiness of face and pitting of uh, with pitting pilari most present no signs of chronic liver disease like pharma erythema spider nevi per abdomen liver was palpable 3 cm below the costal margin in the mid clavicular line and 4 cm in the cephalic sternum firm in consistency and spleen was palpable 3 cm in the left mid clavicular line okay so you have found out that the patient has got now a firm hepatosplenomegaly jaundice some evidence of fluid yeah, of decompensation 
this is the extra information now what investigate what what would you want to do for this patient uh, the routine uh, hemogram ma'am uh, we'll have to uh, along okay. with it definitely liver function test for what uh, what type of like she has uh, mild uh, high colored urine so to assess the bilirubin and uh, the pattern okay. of transaminases so can be interpreted okay ma'am uh, hemoglobin is lack of time in. so why don't we just directly interpret it yeah. uh, he has mild anemia liver function shows a higher direct hyperbilirubinemia with uh, mild transaminases uh, sgp as got is one is it direct direct ma'am 25 with the direct is it direct ma'am okay it is direct hyperbilirubin is it indirect or direct i to direct ma'am direct conjugated direct hyperbilirubin Okay, the total bill room is twenty-five, and the direct is fourteen. So it's more than. Uh, so this it's not predominantly room. direct. It is a, actually a mix. Yeah. Um, more than fifty okay. percent we and, can consider that. And the hair hypoglob hypoalbuminemia, age reversal, and elevated alkaline phosphates. Okay. So it's also a cholestatic. Uh, alkaline phosphates. Please don't comment in children. Why do you not comment in children? because alp might be showing the bone uh, when the when there's bone growth where the growth spurt alp elevation exactly. might be showing the okay. be there so it's for, it is a normal for the age but you cannot use it to interpret a liver function okay. test so what is a better method GGT, of gtgt can be done gtgt can be done you can do a gtgt in addition to the alp do not use the alp alone as an interpretation for his liver function test but definitely there is an abnormality of the uh, liver function test what is striking in this uh, liver um, liver function test jo or uh, aniket anybody uh, sgot predominantly higher than sgpt would you would you have expected this lft from this child with a single presentation He's having only uh, uh, the symptoms for one month duration, yes, and now yes. you are saying that his bilirubin is twenty five, and his GOT PT is only in the hundreds, and his GPT is actually almost normal. So, what does that? Uh, what kind of interpretation can you make from that? Uh, it's more of a like it's not liver specific. Is it patient. acute hepatitis? It is not liver specific. You said. Ah uh, yes, ma'am. No. Why do you say that? Ah, uh, because S G O S G P T is more A L T is more liver specific, ma'am. So, in a patient okay. with anemia, S G O T elevation we should rule out other causes like hemolysis or uh, like L T H and other in things. In which case, be. in which case, Wilson's, okay. Wilson's in which case, what will be the bilirubin pattern? A bilirubin will be. You are talking about test. only hemolysis. No, ma'am. Yeah, Maybe you are not seeing in this. You are seeing. A... You might yeah, be. So you are getting a mixed pattern. So you are saying ah, yes, not. You can't say non-hepatic right away like that. If there is an albumin which is low and INR which is high, and a bilirubin that is this deranged with a mixed pattern, you cannot say it is non-hepatic. It is a different okay. pattern from what you expected. You can okay, al okay. always say that. This is typical of probably metabolic conditions like Wilson's disease, in which you will find that the there is a dis there is a um, there is a elevation of SGOT. incongruency between the bilirubin rise and the SGOT PT the... changes. And of course, in many conditions, you will find an SGOT is higher than the SGPT. Here, you also have coagulopathy with an INR of two point eight. What are the investigations do you want? Uh, definitely all. The... I'll Why just rush it because we have to finish in another ten minutes. Viral markers, first of all, okay. to rule out all the HPCG is negative, and the A and E IgM is negative, HCV is negative, ANA, SMA, LKM negative, but the free serial plasmin is very low. Okay, and the normal levels I put in the brackets for you to understand. USG I've demonstrated. So this is your uh, available investigation. Any more investigations that you want? Now that you have had this many investigations with you, we'll treat this as a short case. We'll just directly go into the and, rest of the uh, investigations. Coombs test, peripheral smear to see if there is because Coombs negative, 
hemolytic anemia strongly we can uh, there's an indication no not indication it uh, directs okay. towards wilson's disease okay it's comb test is negative okay and peripheral okay. smear with other features of like you see if there is hemolysis ldh or uh, t count okay. all can be with seen there, if there are signs of hemolysis man. okay Retic count is normal. LDH is two hundred and fifty. Uh, then definitely to uh, rule out Wilson's, uh, we'll have to do a twenty-four uh, hour copper. Before that, you can do a eye okay. test to see if a retinal examination to see if there is a KF ring. Okay, very good. So you can do a. K ring test. The K ring came as negative. The twenty-four hour urinary copper was low. CT abdomen was done because the patient uh, was being evaluated for other uh, treatments. So the uh, CT showed a coarse liver with nodules, but there's no HCC. There's mild splenomegaly. Incidentally, an endoscopy was also done, which did not did not show any viruses. So what is a K ring, uh, Anikit? Is Anikit? Uh, it, it is because of the deposition of the uh, a copper in the dismissed membrane of the cornea. Okay, and how do you look for it? Uh, in slit lamp examination. No, can you? Is it possible to look for it in a direct? I, I I agree. This is the best way to see in a cave ring is by slit lamp. But clinically, when you are examining the patient, when you are doing the physical examination, you also say no pigmented ring in the cornea so how do you examine for a pigmented ring in the cornea you can look for it microscopically also you may not find it but you have to look for it so how do you look for it yes so can you just explain how do you look for it anybody can anybody the, can volunteer jo apple uh, ek the location of the kf ring yes Where is it? So how will you look for it? Uh, will you shine the light straight on the eyes? Tangentially. So you have to put the light tangentially, and what will be the? Uh, how will you position yourself, and how will you position the child? Okay, I'll just go ahead. There's no time, so uh, the light is shown tangentially from the side. the child is made to either lie down that would be a better position wherein the child can look straight up you have to lift the cornea and look for the this is a kf ring so you have to look lift the cornea and look for the kf ring in the superior and inferior limbus because sometimes that is the only place where it is seen initially it comes in the upper limbus then it comes in the lower limbus and then it becomes all around so this is one of my patients for whom you can see a very well Uh, established kf ring the kf ring is present uh, in most of the patients 95% of the patients with neurological manifestation but in 10 year old children sometimes 50% of the patient even if they have hepatic involvement the kf ring can be negative so absence of kf ring does not mean the child does not have a wilson's disease of course you have to do slit lamp examination but it may not be present in this patient so pseudo kf ring can also be seen in some conditions where there is cholestatic jaundice mm -hmm. This is another patient for whom we diagnosed last week. Can you see there is a clear rim of cornea between the ring and the edge of the um, and the sclera. So that is the typical manifestation of a KF ring, wherein you can see a golden or a, a golden brown color ring in the edge of the cornea. This child it is little more clearer. It can be seen microscopically when the iron when the copper levels become very high. But an absent KF ring in a child it does not rule out Wilson's disease. That is the point I wanted to emphasize. always look at the upper and lower limbs because you can miss it if you look directly in so i also wanted to ask uh, uh, what is cerebroplasm but because of lack of time i'll just go uh, rapidly through the uh, slides this can be measured by two my two or three methods the enzymatic is most of our hospitals we do the radio assay or the uh, radial immunodeficiency uh, assays these overestimate the cerebroplasm so when you do a cerebroplasm and you find that it's borderline look at the type of testing that you have done 
it if it's enzymatic test it is much more reliable but if the ceruloplasmin is borderline and you have done the immunodeficient method of the immunoassays it can take it as with a pinch of salt because of the overestimation uh, jo in what are the condition if the patient may be having wilson's disease but the ceruloplasmin may still be borderline can you think of any other reason why it may be there like that mam ceruloplasmin borderline ceruloplasmin you expect it to be low Okay, known okay. case of wilson's patient if you find that it is not low but it is normal what could be the reason any other reason other than the stated here maybe uh, you commonly acute phase it's an acute phase reaction yes it's an acute phase reaction no, yeah. so in yeah. cases of acute wilson's Hepatitis. you cannot look at the ceruloplasmin level usually they are better uh, indicators of wilson disease when the patient is quiescent or for siblings so that's not a very good method when you have acute wilson's so this is what i wanted to say about kefring so this is a patient with cld low ceruloplasmin no kefring what next quickly you were saying something dr jo Any other method to identify whether uh, patient has got Wilson's? Any other non-invasive uh, method? Liver biopsy. Three copper, ma'am. Copper. And the serum. Yeah. So you said before, before you do the liver test, you have can do a twenty-four hour urine copper, hour copper test. So any any clues on how you do a twenty-four hour urine copper? I won't go into too much into detail. Just tell me how you do it. Uh, in a copper free like it's not a it should be a uh, copper free container you have to and, take a copper free vessel yeah and then ask the patient to uh, first void and from that time onwards the next week if you're starting at 8 pm ask the patient to void whatever urine is there in the bladder and from that time onwards you should collect it till so the, the next day excellent so that's a 24 hour urine copper which is a baseline copper what is a penicillin challenge copper penicillin challenge you can give a dose of uh, 500 mg uh, penicillin and uh, yes. then you uh, you should see a rise in uh, the urinary copper level uh, how much how much and how often will you give the specific this is specific way in giving it right So you give 500 mg in in Pretty children nice. above 12 years. You give at zero and 12 hour. You give two uh, two doses of uh, silamin, uh, uh, deep enzylamine of 500 mg. Say you are starting at five at eight am. You give one at eight am and again at eight pm. That is 12 hours later. You start okay. collecting the urine at eight am when the first okay. dose of deep enzylamine is given. You continue collecting the urine till the night eight pm dose. It's given, and again continue to the next day, 8 a.m. That is a 24-hour urine collection during which time the two doses of deep enzylamine yeah. must be given. That is one at 8 a.m., one at 8 p.m. But the collection of the urine will be from 8 a.m. in the morning till next day, 8 okay. a.m. So that okay. is a 24-hour enzylamine yeah. challenge. Now these are two different tests. 24-hour urine copper test is a baseline test. If the level is high, you don't have to do the 24-hour yeah. enzylamine challenge test. it was previously this 24 hour pencilum and challenge test was being done when the urine a baseline copper was not uh, significant enough just to bring it out make sure that the patient is passing so that's uh, that's the other test you can do so you have uh, a urine 24 hour copper a pencilum and challenge test which sometimes is being done a kefring a low ceruloplasmin and with this you are able to make a diagnosis of wilson's disease if one of this is negative or not there what is the next test one of the students had just now said something in the liver what is your next test liver bio mam liver bio yeah, i think my only joe is answering yes is the liver biopsy dry copper weight yeah. in the so each gram each gram of liver man. more than 250 microgram okay. so would be before you do that before you do that what will the liver biopsy itself show uh orslin what will you look for or spleen staining okay will show what is other uh, other thing roda 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 min or spleen what is other thing for copper roda min roda min and then 
okay what are the other findings what are the histopathological findings not just the staining no the other the pathology of the liver is also important so what will you look for in the pathology uh, of the liver biopsy that will be suggestive of wilson's disease steatosis anybody steatosis microvascular yes very good micro and macrovascular steatosis you look for interface hepatitis which is not very severe just a mild spillover will be there you can find uh, features of chronic hepatitis as well as bridging fibrosis cirrhosis and even regenerative nodules can be seen and of course the staining can be there so some you were mentioning about the copper way uh, in the liver so how do you do that can somebody tell me copper estimation which is the gold standard i think you all know i think you're fatigued what is the technique it has an assembly to nuclear uh, sir uh, spectrometry sir spectrometry what is the first part of it mr spectrometry how you what do you take <laughs> what do you take and how much do you take a gram atomic absorption analysis uh, is done you have to make sure again that you have a copper free container so it has to be sent in a specific way sometimes some uh, labs accept the paraffin embedded sample but mostly it's a copper free container it is done by atomic absorption analysis i think amrita was doing by spectrophotometry at least some time back but now i'm not sure but uh, usually it is sent to br brc in bombay the normal copper is less than 50 microgram it's and in wilson's disease it is more than 250 microgram per gram of dry weight of liver dry when will you get a false negative when you will get false um, negative dr false. aniket Uh, I think they have left. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. More than fifty people are still watching in the Facebook okay. and here. Okay. 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 Ravi Kiran. I hope we can finish. Uh, by when when Dr. can uh, liver copper be negative on quantitative assay in the Wilson disease? Okay. No one seems to be. Okay, Doctor Joe. Some somebody can. Yeah. nobody is in a position to answer so dr joe can you tell when is it false negative what condition uh, so during a false the negative is the patient got wilson's disease wilson's yeah wilson's disease. disease is there why the, during treatment on treatment no you have not made a diagnosis okay. so how will you give treatment okay So, do you know where you're putting your liver biopsy needle? You're not able to take a target biopsy or anything. So, if there is a okay. patchy distribution of copper, which is very common, okay. or you target a nodule, in these patients, you may target an area of the liver which is does not have much copper, and that is a fallacy. I mean, that is an accepted fallacy of this test. So, if you get a high copper content, you take it as uh, significant. But you do not get it. You still do not negate the possibility of Wilson's, because there is patchy distribution in the liver, and you may have targeted a nodule. And sometimes, when you do for asymptomatic siblings, the amount of copper in the liver mm. may not be enough. And of course, in cholestatic liver disease, it may be falsely yes. falsely estimated. So, this is the algorithm which is given when you have an unexplained liver disease in a patient like this. and you have a serum celluloplasmin 24 hour urine copper and you do a slit lamp exam so these are the three bedside tests that you can do if the kf ring is present celluloplasmin is significantly low less than 20 especially if it's less than 10 and the 24 hour urine copper is high you don't have to do a liver biopsy the diagnosis of wilson disease is established you can start treatment right away now any one of this is absent then you are in trouble and you need to make another test to make the diagnosis now the problem is if any one of this absent then you have to go in for liver biopsy with the possible of histology or the stain must be positive or of course the quantification now the quantification is not always possible or may not be always positive also so you have to go for genetic testing which is also not possible so understanding that these investigations may not be available for all patients at all periods you have some scoring systems can anybody Lipsic. volunteer to say the name of the scoring system lipsic yes. scoring system who's that jo oh okay. yes so it's a lipsic jo. scoring system yeah so it's a lipsic uh, lipsic so scoring system lipsic is a place in germany and where this system was uh, uh, identified 
and according to this if you have these uh, investigations available and a score of 4 and more the diagnosis is established you can look up the references in this if it is less than that less than 2 the diagnosis is unlikely if it is 3 three you have to do more testing similarly in alf you have another prognostic indication as to whether the patient will uh, will require transplantation or not. this is just because i wanted to put in scores in wilson disease so what are the clinical man typical clinical manifestations of wilson's disease quickly can somebody say what are the hepatic manifestations uh, hepatitis what are in what yes what are what are the ways in which wilson's disease can present liver manifestations uh, like uh, liver liver failure yes, uh, yes acute liver failure then as a uh, cirrhosis of liver as a chronic hepatitis also can be present okay chronic hepatitis cirrhosis portal hypertension then can they present uh, any other way i think everybody is stuck so can they present just as transaminitis can they be asymptomatic asymptomatic transaminitis okay can they present only with fatty liver fatty liver you have to remember okay. that isolated fatty liver in a adolescent child you must investigate for wilson disease it's one of the common presentation of nafld in children also there okay. can be presentations which resemble autoimmune hepatitis right from uh, asymptomatic hepatomegaly up to advanced liver disease and acute liver failure all manifestations are seen neurological they can present without mm -hmm. liver disease mm -hmm. directly as neurological tremors. problems tremors yes chorea so all the extra peripheral mm -hmm. symptoms mm -hmm. pseudo bulbar palsy etc can be there and psychiatric manifestations can be there other systems a multitude of systems can be involved we have had patients who are present in the gynecological department for amenorrhea who are present in the orthopedic department with fractures and who are presenting in renal department in the nephrology department with glomerular nephritis etc so all systems can be involved so don't negate this if you find any other system involvement plus liver involvement then you know that this patient could be having a wilson disease is a great masquerader it can come to any department so how do you initiate treatment for these patients that once that you have made the diagnosis and what are the available medications jo uh, have, have you you have wilson patients uh, you must okay revikiran tell us how do you treat wilsons everybody is treating no at least one or two cases you have treated mm -hmm. What are the principles of treatment? We will give OD penicillin. So you have a principle. There is a guiding principle for treatment of Wilson. What is that? Achieve uh, negative copper balance or decoppering, and Copering. maintain the negative balance. That's it. What is the medication that you do for that? Various drugs can be uh, trimethine. zinc what is the main drug that we use here you must not have used trimethyl so penicillin so d penicillin is it got anything to do with penicillin that's a trick question it is uh, it's a sulfhydryl <laughs> it's a sulfhydryl form of penicillin but it's d penicillin so d penicillin trimethyl and zinc acetate are the main like uh, medication that i used so what is deep penicillin and what is trimethyl do and what does zinc acetate do what are the what are the roles and which will you choose will you choose zinc acetate for this patient the first uh, two drugs are the chelators they chelate the uh, copper the copper and the last one they activate the uh, the zinc zinc acetate no oh, yeah, yeah, sound has some issue sound has some issue we are not able to clear properly maybe how does zinc act uh, prevent absorption of copper uh, prevent absorption of copper from the intestines and deep penicillin and trimethyl are the two medications that chelate the copper so which will you choose deep penicillin or trimethyl uh, trimethyl usually used in neurological manifestations which one Which one is used for neurological manifestations? Trinity. Trinity. 
actually no both deep enslavement and triantine both can actually worsen the neurological manifestations because of this decoupling effect the increase amount of copper can actually worsen the neurological situation so if you have a patient with liver disease who also has a neurological problem you have to decoup uh, coup the patient or give start the chelators very slowly or the other option would be to start on zinc and ammonium molybdate so tetathione and ammonium molybdate is the other option it was used earlier and then went into uh, faded into oblivion and it is now becoming um, repopular becoming popular again because of its efficacy in treating neuro wilsons so but for hepatic wilsons you have to treat with one of the chelating agents deep enslamine is the cheaper version but has got more side effects triantin has a similar effect but with lesser side effects but it's um, very very costly one capsule costs 200 rupees whereas penicillin one capsule costs only 10 rupees so it's like un, uh, the cost is not very comparable at all so if the patient can tolerate deep penicillin most of them do you start with deep penicillin and you also start with zinc acid to reduce the absorption and how long will you give the treatment uh, till you have attained uh, uh, the the core negative copper balance and how do you know that you have maintained negative copper balance how will you know you should uh, always assess the urinary copper urinary copper level man okay so you if you do a 24 hour urinary copper which you can do annually you will find that the urine copper is coming less and once mm. it reaches baseline levels then you know that the patients they are compliant but sometimes the patients do but, not take any of the medications and they still have low copper because they are not having to pre-uric effect so how do you differentiate these two so when a patient has having low urine copper it should has to be one of two things that either there is no copper to be passed in the urine therefore complete uh, negative no copper, copper balance has been achieved pardon uh, the if it's if uh, stool uh, the drug like ma'am if it's on zinc actually um and the patients on zinc actually the management is different because you might not expect a urine to urine copper to go no but you are not uh, you, what is the idea of giving zinc here no ma'am zinc basically you give this keep the patient only on zinc no ma'am definitely initial picture to dk t uh to kill it and decrease the copper load definitely a big uh, uh chelator should be the initial treatment ma'am and once you have yes. attained uh, chelation you can maybe maintain with zinc ma'am to reduce the further that is the idea that you give uh pen the penicillin and zinc along with uh, in both together so that's what my this question is what precautions will you ad advise your patients when taking these patients they are going to give uh deep penicillin and zinc is there any any particular advice that you need to give the patients urine dain it should Pardon? not be taken at one time both should not be taken together because one... so deep penicillin and zinc should not be taken together because they negate each other's effects both are taken both are affected by food intake so should be taken half an hour before food or two hours after food so just imagine a school going child who has to take deep penicillin twice or thrice a day and zinc twice or thrice a day because that is a recommended dosage now if he takes one half an hour before and another two hours after food he cannot manage his normal lifestyle he cannot go to school he cannot uh, eat any snack etc so you have to give priority to deep penicillin in the initial phases till the copper effect is or the negative copper is balanced and then till then you can give zinc once a day is also enough deep penicillin morning and night and zinc once a day is good enough in the initial phases once the uh, negative copper effect is made, achieved you can reduce the dose of pen deep penicillin and continue with zinc now the western recommendations are that once you have negative copper balance you can stop the deep penicillin but in indian patients that always has a, a negative effect the patients usually rebound so you can always reduce the deep penicillin to the minimum dosage one more precaution is you have to give pyridoxin to supplement because it causes uh, pyridoxine deficiency uh, so i told you about this the second thing is answer to the second question is if you are not sure about the compliance you can keep the patient in the hospital and give the urine uh, the penicillin challenge to the patient under supervision so that you know that 
the patient has been compliant with the medication. Now, if the patient is coming on, uh, for follow up and you have to decide whether the patient is improving or not improving, when will you decide that the patient is improving? Therefore, will, does not need a transplant. Like I told you, his INR is 2.8, his albumin is 2.1. So, how long will you wait before you decide that this patient needs transplant or not? Any idea? Any, any suggestions? Know. Okay, you have to wait. You can wait for two to three months. If in two to three months you find that the patient is steady or slightly improving, you probably can wait for another three to four, three to six months. Because it takes six months before the complete coprouric effect is obtained and only then will you have the actual picture. But if in the next one to two months the INR worsens or the bilirubin worsens, then you cannot wait. The patient will need transplant. So this is a trivia question for to wake up everybody, anybody who's asleep. Can you tell me what is the name of the sign in Neuro Wilson's? And, uh, it's a quiz question for many quizzes. Yeah. Panda. 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 Yeah. Panda. Can you find? Can you see the panda? Yes. Midbrain. So these are the hyperintensities in the basal ganglia and the thalamus, and that is the. Panda sign, which is classical of the Neuro Wilson's, and it is uh, in most quizzes, it will come there. So, just for you to uh, wake up. So, what is the role of genetic evaluation? What is the role of genetic evaluation in today's world? What do you want to do for this Wilson's patients? All uh, first degree uh, siblings. Money concern. Okay, so uh, genetic evaluation in our country. We don't know the actual genes that causes it. We know that uh, we know the gene and the location of the gene, but the type of mutation that is seen in India is not the same as that is seen in the West. So if you do a random genetic evaluation, you may not find anything in some of our patients. But if you have an index case and you find that that genetic uh, the defect is mapped, then you can look for the similar genetic defect in the siblings. But it's only for antenatal uh, counseling. It does not prognosticate the patient at all. So it does nothing to the treatment. You still have to continue the treatment. You still have to monitor the patient. It is only to screen the uh, to find out whether any antenatal uh, advice can be given. So what about the uh, screening of the asymptomatic siblings? How will you go about it? It's an important question. No? Supposing you have a patient, an index patient who has died or a patient who is diagnosed with chronic liver disease with liver failure and maybe to even transplant, you have to find out whether other siblings are having the disease. So what investigations will you do for them? Seroloplasmin. The Seroloplasmin. Seroloplasmin. K-frame. Okay, yes. So look for K-frame and look for the 24-hour urine copper. But in these patients, because there is already a sibling who has been diagnosed with Wilson's disease, you do not need all three criteria. If they have mild transaminitis with low seroloplasmin, that is enough to make a diagnosis of Wilson's disease in the sibling. So please remember that if you are taking the index case, the previous uh, algorithm that I showed you, that's necessary to make a diagnosis or the scoring system is necessary. But if there is an index diagnosed case of Wilson's disease that gives a very high score for the next sibling, if he has transaminitis and low cellular person, that is good enough to make a diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Okay. Just for your uh, trivia knowledge, this is an article that has been published in April 2021 of um, American Association of uh, Liver Disease. And this was the diagnostic tools that we have so far explained. And this is the traditional diagnostic tools, but they have now come up with, this is not validated, mind you, this is just for your trivial knowledge or just for understanding. There are two uh, suggested tests. I'm not sure about how they do it and why they do it and all. But uh, the first test is a radioactive copper test, which is done in asymptomatic siblings. Because in many of them, you cannot do a liver biopsy because they are asymptomatic. So doing a liver biopsy is like overkill for this patient. So in lieu of doing a liver quantitative copper, you can do a radioactive copper ratio, wherein copper is infused intravenously and then measured within the liver after two 24 and 48 hours and the ratio is brought out. If the ratio is less than 0.3, a diagnosis of Wilson's disease is made. And these are just done in certain um, academic centers, not everywhere. The other option is to do a genetic analysis. And one more is the exchangeable copper, uh, relative exchangeable copper ratio. 
uh, these are the ones that are coming up they are not much validated but these are the things that you may be asked for in your exam and of course the current chelating agents are these like i told you the tetrathioid molybdate and gene therapy are the ones which may be the future of wilson's disease wilson disease is very amenable to uh, gene therapy because it's supposed to be a single gene defect so if you can uh, um, somehow make the atps gene into the body through any of these adenovirus vectors and if it gets uh, rooted in the liver then it can actually lead on to a cure of the disease without further medication so thank you for your for waiting so long for this class i hope you will um, i mean if you have any doubts you can ask me please yeah yeah please ask doubts because dr gida has been so kind enough to take a late night clinics this is the most unusual uh, i think the only clinics uh, which has uh, gone we want 10 o'clock in isc clinic history but still <laughs> but still she is willing to ask she willing willing to answer doubts so we are extremely thankful to you i don't find any questions in the chat box no, related no, to no, wilson so let's relate to wilson let me just see if there are any questions in the chat box i think the answers between uh, for the questions we have answered most of it most of it I think most of them are answers to questions. Do you have any questions, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Aniketa, Dr. Jo, regarding Wilson? No, I have a question. I think that's an important. Which situation? Case. In which situation you yes, decide sir. to use trinitine? Okay, when patients are allergic to penicillin, that okay. is the most common situation because we find uh, about one in ten patients or one in fifteen patients are allergic to penicillin. They cannot tolerate the medication. or they develop severe reaction yes, side effects sometimes okay. they develop nephrotic range of protein urea etc mm -hmm. yeah so okay. side effects no, and even sometimes vomiting uh, intolerance to the medications also is seen so those patients we use trinity okay i think they don't have questions i think uh, they have to brush up a lot <laughs> regarding medicines so thank you I, thank you dr gida you have so been long. very very helpful and i will request you for future clinics as well so question in the chat box what is that this one question chat box in wilson's disease in pregnancy how do we manage so um, wilson's disease if the disease is not very well controlled it is just like any chronic disease uh, they can have uh, fetal abortions uh, iugrs etc but if the disease is well controlled and they are on maintenance uh, therapy then pregnancy is usually uneventful they usually have a normal delivery and the complications are less and you are asking the pediatrician about treating pregnancy and wilson disease <laughs> okay thank you thank you dr gida that that, that was that extremely there was somebody again mentioned any role for plasma exchange during alf i think plasma exchange is coming in a big way yes. in all alf so i think that can be as considered as positive uh, i think epen is doing lot of studies in that aspect and epen also has uh, published articles on the variants of mutation which is found in india so candidates you have to be careful when you have to also look at the background uh, academic interest of your examiners okay and if your examiner seems to be an authority on any particular disease like uh, uh, wilson etc uh, you have to be very careful or okay. at least do not bluff that is my request okay so thank you dr gida you have been very kindful to thank extend you. the clinic yeah, to late night so on behalf of isc isc kerala chapter i thank you very much and i also thank you dr banu for uh, having given taken that uh, precious time for this clinics and thank you all the discussion and good night to all of you we'll wind up okay good night